This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by my co-host Juan Gonzalez at his home in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases in the United States has topped 6 million, with a death toll of over 183,000. More than a million people tested positive over the past three weeks in the United States, and over 4,000 Americans died of COVID-19 just during last week's Republican National Convention alone. That's more than the total number of people killed in the 9-11 attacks. This comes as the Food and Drug Administration's approved the use of remdesivir for all patients hospitalized with COVID-19, despite a lack of published scientific support. Meanwhile, the FDA has ousted its top spokeswoman and a PR consultant just days after FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn apologized for overstating the positive results of using blood plasma as a treatment for COVID-19. Under enormous pressure from President Trump, who called the FDA part of the deep state, the FDA recently gave emergency agency use authorization for the plasma treatment. The FDA chief is now admitting the agency may also consider emergency use approval for a COVID-19 vaccine before phase three trials are complete. Meanwhile, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention has quietly dropped its recommendation that people quarantine for 14 days after traveling from an area with a high rate of infection, even though public health experts say the move will undermine efforts to control the spread of the disease. The decision was reportedly made by the White House Coronavirus Task Force, while top public health expert Dr. Anthony Fauci was undergoing surgery and recovering. The changes were backed by the task force's newest member, Dr. Scott Atlas, a Fox News contributor and neuroradiologist from Stanford's conservative Hoover Institution, with no expertise in epidemiology or infectious disease. Atlas is the focus of a damning new report by The Washington Post, headlined, New Trump Pandemic Advisor Pushes Controversial Herd Immunity Strategy Worrying Public Health Officials. For more, we're joined by one of the lead authors, Yasmin Abu Talib, national health reporter for The Washington Post. Also with us, Professor Greg Gonsalves, assistant professor of epidemiology of microbial diseases at the Yale School of Public Health and co-director of the Global Health Justice Partnership. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Yasmin, let's begin with you. Why don't you lay out what you found about the president's new addition to the coronavirus task force, who he recently introduced. Tell us about Dr. Scott Atlas and what he's pushing. So the president announced earlier in August that Scott Atlas was joining as a pandemic advisor. Uh, we know that he meets with the president almost every day. The administration brought him on uh, because earlier this summer, Trump had encouraged his advisors to look for um, a doctor or some sort of medical advisor with Ivy League or top university credentials, who basically would argue what he wanted to hear about how the pandemic was going, that the threat was receding, that the country should reopen, basically take the opposite tack of Dr. Burks and Dr. Fauci, who are two of the top doctors on the task force, um, and who have said the pandemic is a threat in every part of the country. They've urged uh, partial lockdowns in areas experiencing surges. They've encouraged state mask mandates. Um, and those aren't things the president really wants to hear. So Scott Atlas um, is more in line with what the president wants to do and wants to hear on the pandemic. So he's said things like kids don't get COVID, which there is no uh, evidence for and that they don't spread it. Um, he said that schools should reopen no matter what, that college sports should resume. Um, he's also pushing this herd immunity strategy, which basically says that you let the coronavirus spread through most of the population and you protect the most vulnerable populations. So nursing homes, prisons, you know, tightly congregated places. Um, it's, that's impractical because vulnerable people live with healthy people and they're also, the science on coronavirus is still evolving. So um, there are plenty of young, healthy people who get coronavirus and die or who develop long-term complications. So almost every public health expert we spoke with uh, very much argued against this strategy, um, saying it was dangerous, and some of the dangers could even be unknown. Uh, during a COVID-19 yeah. news conference on Monday in Tampa Bay, Florida, Dr. Scott Atlas of the White House Coronavirus Task Force was asked about your report that he's pushing the herd immunity strategy. 
25 plus percent of our young adults, 18 to 25, have contemplated suicide in the past 30 days. This has really got to end. And we know the president here has a strategic and appropriate policy, which is protecting the vulnerable. We know who's at risk here. It's not everybody. It's not about all the cases that's the most important metric. It's about saving lives by protecting the vulnerable, by preventing hospital overcrowding, which we are really doing well, and by opening the economy, opening the schools, because American lives are being destroyed. Yasmin Abu Talib, if you could respond, that was him speaking on Fox News. Yeah, I mean, he's he's essentially advocating a, a herd immunity strategy there. He's maybe not saying it explicitly, but he's saying, um, you know, plenty of people are not vulnerable to this. Just protect uh, the most vulnerable, um, you know, the elderly, people with underlying health conditions. So he's not saying it explicitly, but those are the tenets of the strategy, that it's not a big deal if it gets into the general population and you just sort of want to sequester off the most vulnerable people and, and make sure they're protected. He also talks about preventing hospital overcrowding, but that's uh, really difficult to do if you're letting the virus spread unchecked through the population. And Yasmin Abu the the issue here of herd immunity, I mean, Sweden is the, is the biggest example that is held up in terms of a deliberate policy of a government to, to uh, develop herd immunity. Uh, but could you talk about your understanding of what how harmful it could be in the U.S., given the high percentage of Americans who have chronic conditions, whether it's asthma, diabetes, uh, obesity, and so forth? Right. I mean, I think one of the important things is Sweden has about a 10 million person population and the U.S. is 330 million people. Um, the U.S. also has extraordinarily high rates of underlying health conditions that are known uh, risk factors for coronavirus. So uh, like you laid out, obesity, heart disease, uh, diabetes, all of these, you know, um, make people much more vulnerable for severe effects of coronavirus or more susceptible to dying from the disease. So, um, you know, this idea that you can you separate the vulnerable from the healthy is just impractical. I mean, you know, someone with diabetes lives in the same household as someone who's otherwise healthy. Um, not every vulnerable person lives in a nursing home. And, Greg, and in, term, oh, ahead, in terms Ron. of the CDC recommendation recently that the change uh, against uh, quarantining for 14 days, uh, if you've come from an area that is uh, uh, that has a high high incidence rates of, uh, of COVID-19. Right. So the CDC last week changed its testing guidance to say that asymptomatic people who come in contact with a confirmed infection don't necessarily need to get tested. And we lay out in the article that there, you know, while the White House hasn't formally embraced this strategy, there are policies that start to fall in line with the tenets of a herd immunity strategy. So um, unlike countries that are ramping up testing and contact tracing and have been for some time, the U.S. seems to be moving in a direction of testing fewer people. So this testing change last week saying you don't need to test um, asym or don't necessarily need to test asymptomatic people who came into contact with a confirmed infection. The CDC estimates that up to 40 percent of cases are asymptomatic. And we know that the surge that we saw this summer in many parts of the country was largely driven by young, healthy people asymptomatically spreading the disease. Um, you know, we also laid out that they invoked the Defense Production Act to ramp up tests to nursing homes, but you haven't seen them significantly ramp up testing in other parts of the country, whether for schools, businesses, just the general population. So you already see this strategy of let's test and you know aggressively test this, these vulnerable populations that we know are most at risk, and just sort of you know not worry as much about the more general population. And at a roundtable yesterday that Scott Atlas was at. He said, you know, young, healthy people don't need to get tested. He was still reiterating aspects of this. So I want to go to that response of Scott Atlas directly responding to your report, Yasmin. I was shocked to see the story uh, because they never asked me for a comment, first of all. And that, that's, uh, you know, there's news, there's opinion, and then there's overt lie. And that was never a strategy that was advocated by me and the administration. The president does not have a strategy like that. I've never advocated that strategy. So uh, that whole discussion uh, in The Washington Post was just really sort of irresponsible to write an article like that. So can you respond, Yasmin Abu Talib? Did you reach out to Scott Atlas? We did, and we updated the article that included it. We reached out through the White House three different times. 
to give him a chance to comment, to ask for an interview. Um, I think it was August 21st, 28th, and 29th, um, both through email and through phone. So there was plenty of time and, and plenty of opportunity to comment. Um, and we know from several sources that he's pushing this strategy. And if you just look at the public statements, I mean, he advocated a herd immunity strategy when in an appearance on Fox that we also quoted in the article um, at that event yesterday in Florida. He was also advocating tenants of a herd immunity strategy. So, um, you know, there was plenty of time to comment. He did comment after the fact. Um, so, you know, that's just not true that we didn't reach out. Um, and I think the, the policies and his public position speak for themselves. Um, I want to bring Gun Greg Gonsalves into this conversation uh, with the Yale School of Public Health. Um, Professor Gonsalves, if you can respond to this issue of herd immunity and then go on to all the messages who, that are being changed right now, and then particularly talk about what Dr. Khan, the head of the FDA, has just that Dr. Han, the head of the FDA, has just floated the idea that the vaccine phase three trial will not be done before they move ahead with making it available to the public. What's happening here? So a couple of things on herd immunity. I think uh, Yasmin's article in, it, in the Washington Post deserves a Pulitzer. It was meticulously, meticulously researched, uh, thoroughly documented, and any attempt to suggest that um, um, there, it was filled with any kinds of falsehood, it's not true. I mean, many people in the public health community have watched this with horror, um, the sort of implicit herd immunity strategy, downplaying asymptomatic testing, uh, now the, the withdrawal of the 14-day quarantine period uh, for people moving from one part of the country to the other, which might be a red zone or a hot zone. Um, this, this still sort of inability to get uh, uh, the amount of PPE we need for our healthcare workers, let alone teachers and others who are going to be in high contact, uh, uh, close contact, high frequency uh, interactions with people. So the herd immunity is the implicit uh, policy of the United States. And I think they realize it's politically toxic, and so they don't want to use the phrase. But if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it, it is a duck. And this is essentially a herd immunity strategy. And it's entirely risky for many of the reasons you mentioned. Um, one is because um, we have many more people with um, underlying conditions in the United States. We also don't have the social safety net or the healthcare uh, infrastructure that uh, many of the Nordic countries have. So we, we, we don't even be able to deal with the sort of impact of the deaths and suffering we'd see um, by a continuation of the, the White House's strategy. What Dr. Hahn has been um, doing at the FDA, first with the hydroxychloroquine uh, emergency use authorization, now with the, the convalescent plasma uh, uh, emergency use authorization is to do the bidding of the White House based on on scanty data uh, about um, treatments for 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 coronavirus. Um, the danger about the vaccine EUA uh, before phase three um, trial results are out uh, is 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 much more dire because we give treatments to the sick and in this case to many uh, people who are hospitalized. Um, vaccines go to millions of people. Um, we depend on them to be effective, uh, so people. Uh, don't get the wrong impression about what they should be doing in terms of uh, social distancing and other behavior um, because they're vaccinated. And we depend on them to be safe. Um, a vaccine is going to be an important long-term way to control the virus, and we need a public um, confidence in vaccines. Remember, pre-COVID, half, half of Americans don't get vaccinated against seasonal flu. We've had outbreaks of measles and diphtheria and other childhood uh, diseases because we have pockets of people who have skepticism about vaccines. And Dr. Hans. Um, sort of willingness to play fast and loose with the data when vaccine developers, um, researchers, immunologists, virologists are, are, are terrified that they're going to sort of get out ahead of the data again because the president wants something by the end of the by the end of uh, uh, October so he can bring it into the election week with him uh, hoping for victory. But, you know, this is three strikes for the FDA, hydroxychloroquine, convalescent plasma and um, and, and the potential vaccine EUA. Um, Harold Varmus, former NIH director today, and Rajiv Shah, who's head of the Rockefeller Foundation, just said, stop listening to the CDC because of their asymptomatic testing language, um, because of the stuff about quarantines. Now, what are we going to do about the FDA? They're not giving us uh, reliable information about the things we put in our bodies, drugs and vaccines. It's their basic um, statutory mandate, and they're failing us right now. And Professor Gonzalez, what about this whole issue that even countries that uh, did practice uh, sh sharp lockdowns uh, earlier on in the pandemic, like Spain, are now seeing a, uh, a uh, second wave 
uh, of uh, increasing uh, infections. Uh, your assessment of uh, what should be the right policy here in the United States? So one is, nobody said there was never going to be a second wave. And in fact, many people like Mark Lipsitch at Harvard and others have, have talked about how this is going to sort of be a rolling uh, pandemic around the world. Remember, Spain and Italy were, were, were later to lock down uh, than uh, some other countries in Europe and had very, very substantial epidemics. Um, the point is, is, we need to scale up testing. And as Yasmin is saying, asymptomatics are key to that. Um, we're, of course, we're going to diagnose people who are sick and in hospitals, but we need to know where the virus is, is spreading in communities. Uh, and then we can think about targeted lockdowns. If we had done this in March and April, so lockdown uh, 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 as we're supposed to provide social and economic support so people could isolate at home without uh, economic fears and without social fears, um, and scale up testing, contact tracing, and isolation, we would be in a situation today where we wouldn't be saying, God, should I send my kids to school? Is there going to be an outbreak there? Or I'm sitting at a university campus. Are we worrying about an outbreak of 100, 200, 500 students here on campus? Um, we never did the right thing. Um, we can still turn around, but it really means scaling up testing among asymptomatics, um, getting this uh, third relief bill out of Congress, and not a skinny bill, as Mitch McConnell is suggesting, but one that really provides support for local and state governments, economic and social support for individuals to isolate and to, to social distance if they can, and a rapid scale-up of testing and PPE. And the things that we've been talking about um, left and right, you know, Scott Gottlieb is no flaming liberal. Um, he has talked about this uh, explicitly since March. Uh, people like Andy Slavitt, uh, sort of on the liberal side, have done the same. This is not a bipartisan, this is a bipartisan uh, sort of strategy that's been articulated really since March and April. And the White House keeps turning a blind eye to it, sort of adopting conspiracy theories, um, finding people who will tell them what they want to hear rather than what really needs to be done. Uh, Greg Gonzalez, in one of a long series of tweets Monday, you wrote, <clears throat> Dr. Atlas, a radiologist, has no training or expertise in infectious diseases, but what he does have are the words the president wants to hear. You can let the virus spread widely throughout the U.S. if you just try to keep the elderly safe, open up everything, and let her rip. Talk more about who Scott Atlas is, why he's now got the ear of the president meeting with him almost every day, as Dr. Fauci is recovering um, from throat surgery. And what this means at a time, especially the asymptomatic issue, for so long we've been told people must be tested because asymptomatics can spread um, the COVID-19. Kids are now gathering together all over the country to go to school. And this is exactly the point when the testing is becoming more and more difficult to get and when he is talking about opening things up. Talk about who he is. So, look, uh, Dr. Atlas has medical training. He's a neuroradiologist. There are plenty of people who have um, general medical expertise who have been fine public health and, and uh, agency leaders in the United States. You don't have to be an infectious disease clinician or an infectious disease epidemiologist to do the right thing, but you should know when you're getting out ahead of your skis. And, you know, Dr. Atlas is um, comments are, are so far from the mainstream of thinking in public health and clinical medicine on infectious diseases, it, it's, it, it's astounding. You know, uh, he, he could have engaged experts, um, tried to figure out what the consensus view was, uh, what we needed to do, and to, and to advise the president uh, uh, in that way. But what he's done instead is to sort of think about um, what the president wants to hear. We're doing great. We don't need to do more tests. We can open up the, the economy, uh, open up businesses, open up schools, open up universities, and we can we can sort of um, get to the epidemic in that way. And I so, can, yeah, one more. Um, he, he, because of his um, appearances on Fox News, he caught the president and the White House's attention, and that's why he's sitting in the place that he, he is. Not because he has any specific expertise. He's not edgy. He's not contrarian. He's just simply wrong, uh, foolish, and dangerous. I wanted to ask you if you could put yourself in the shoes of a political leader in the United States or some of these other countries that are dealing with this situation and are finding a, a, a small but significant portions of their populations actively resisting uh, basic public health uh, 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 suggestions or recommendations by their governments about how to prevent the spread of the disease. What do you do with these folks that are in Germany, for instance, there was a protest outside the uh, the German parliament uh, it, of right wing folks who are opposed to the, the uh, lockdown measures uh, in Germany. Could you talk about what you recommend political leaders do in this in this situation? Well, first of all, people like Angela Merkel have been 
actually pretty good in, at sort of rallying their country to do the right thing around social distancing, around understanding the risks presented by the pandemic. Um, and so her and uh, Jacinta Ardern in, in New Zealand have been very good about rallying their countries around uh, a sort of united, comprehensive response. Of course, there are always going to be people who, who, who don't believe what they're being told by their governments um, or, for some other reason, you know, don't want to comply with public health um, uh, recommendations. Think, of, again, back to vaccination, about childhood vaccinations and what we see. And what you have to do is not to shame them and not to, to, to go after them in that way. You need to meet them where they're at, try to figure out what's going on. Um, you need to, to build incentives into the system that helps them get to a better place than they were yesterday. And so, yeah, I, I think there's always going to be a, 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 a minority of people in any given country who are uh, resisting public health orders, who, who See, it, see public health as sort of an imposition on their, their sort of liberties. Um, but even in the United States, remember, we did some great things this spring. Um, we did beat down the virus in many places in this country because we took care of each other. We all stayed at home. We all social distanced. And so we shouldn't allow that generosity and solidarity that we even saw in this country, uh, even though the president uh, would, would be loath to admit it. We want to thank you so much, Greg Gonsalves, for joining us, a professor at the Yale School of Public Health, an epidemiologist. And thank you to Yasmin Abutalib, the Washington Post reporter who broke the story on Dr. Scott Atlas, the new uh, advisor to President Trump on the Coronavirus Task Force. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, President Trump heads to Kenosha, Wisconsin today, despite fierce opposition from the Wisconsin leadership. We're going to look at a case that implicates the very very local authorities who will be dealing with the Jacob Blake case. Stay with us.